Um, all right, we're going to talk about this posterior and uh, multi-direction stability. Um, the, the reason for uh, this uh, clubbing these, these two together is <coughs> they're different from the anterior instability, which is kind of straightforward. It is traumatic anterior instability. We know there's a bank card to repair the bank card, except for when there's bone loss, then it gets a little more interesting and, and uh, controversial. But uh, anterior instability uh, typically is easier to diagnose and, and we know what's happening. Posterior multidirection is a little different, um, and especially seen in this population, the, the, the pediatric adolescent population, they will come to you with some diffuse, well, my shoulder pops and it clicks, and you don't know what to make of it. So uh, it's a little uh, confusing sometimes the presentation and, and trying to diagnose these kids with uh, both posterior and MDI. We know <coughs> there are different types of instability. Uh, basically, we can classify them into uh, the degree, uh, whether it's subluxation versus uh, dislocation, uh, micro instability, um, what a fancy term, but basically it means, you know, we can't figure out what's happening <laughs> with the patient, um, you know, they will say it pops, but, but there's not any demonstrable kind of uh, subluxation that you might find in the office or in the, in the, in the OR. Um, frequency, it could be uh, acute one time, it could be chronic, um, and then obviously the, the etiology. As a traumatic, so we know about MRI or AMBRII, uh, uh, about a traumatic multidirectional and all those things, rehab, uh, and traumatic is um, tubs that's traumatic unidirectional, um, and uh, uh, you know, it usually needs surgery, bank card, and surgery, and then the direction as well. Now, posterior instability is. Uh, the incidence is pretty low, so and it's, it's typically seen in these kind of conditions where um, it's kind of a, like an unusual um, kind of cause of um, dislocation. That said, if you have a patient come in with an electrical shock and has a dislocation, that obviously the patient is more likely to have an anterior dislocation even than posterior dislocation. That's sometimes a trick question that is that is asked. Um, so offensive linemen, um, it's very common. Um, and, and also um, overhead um, throwers, athletes, it, it's common in the scenes along with the slap lesion. So this is a classic article and I decided to include this in our talk because uh, we have come a long way and most of our kind of, um, uh, um, kind of clinical uh, uh, judgment, uh, so as to speak, uh, kind of stem from this article. Uh, and perception um, about these conditions stem from this article, but now we have come a long way. Uh, but this article is, was um, you know, published in '84 and looked at um, a, a group of um, 50 shoulders, 35 patients, and um, a lot of them had voluntary instability. So 80% of them had voluntary instability. It's, it's important to know. Average age of onset is this typical pediatric uh, adolescent age group. Um, and pain was not present in majority, so they came in with, oh, I can, you know, pop my shoulder, and uh, a lot of them were voluntary, so that's, that's important to know. When they elevated the arm or crossed it, and there was some subluxation in the back. So, it is a good study, considering it was done uh, almost 20 years ago. They kind of looked at um, um, surgery versus no surgery, um, and some were sort of treated with a cast, and a spica cast, so it was a kind of a... Um, specific um, um, regimen they had, they, they categorized these patients into two, two main groups and um, 24 shoulders non-surgical, almost 25 were um, surgical. So follow-up is pretty good as well, follow-up five years average in the non-surgical, seven years in the surgical group. So good follow-up, good um, kind of um, you know, definition of surgery versus no surgery, obviously it's not randomized but still uh, it was pretty good. The, the procedures that they did uh, were very invasive and we don't do th these anymore in terms of osteotomy and, and plication uh, and biceps tendon transfer, I don't even know what that means. But that's how they kind of treated these patients and they had these kind of very serious complications out of those 50 shoulders, uh, early osteoarthritis in these young patients, uh, unremitting pain um, and then unlearned neuropraxia obviously very, very serious if you have these kind of complications in this day and age, you, you know, you're looking at um, some legal, uh, you know, issues. So, but that's what they had, they published that and they, this is what they put in, in, in the conclusion uh, in writing that um, voluntary subluxation, there's something wrong with these uh, patients, so there is psychiatric disorder, uh, they're adolescent girls more than boys and then do not operate on these patients. So, this was what 
uh, was a conclusion and that's that's what we carried on for for a long number of time if they are voluntary subluxators especially for posterior instability do not operate on them um, and then you know some of it is true uh, even till date but um, we have more options these days uh, just to recapitulate we know that there is uh, there is um, uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament uh, which is like a hammock and that's the most important ligament that keeps the shoulder stable but as you go up there's also the middle and the superior glenohumeral ligament the middle and the superior glenohumeral ligament they are important for um, uh, for preventing inferior subluxation so that's in the rotator interval and that you need to close if the patient has a positive sulcus sign or inferior subluxation so for a posterior instability what is what is the cause is it bony versus soft tissue for anterior we know it's mainly the anterior labrum which uh, which is uh, which is the culprit and then you can fix that uh, but a posterior, what, why do these patients have posterior instability, uh, especially when there's not much pain? Uh, yes, it could be uh, could be a straightforward posterior dislocation, just like an anterior dislocation, and then we know. But very often, the knot is also associated with glenoid anatomy and the, and the fact that it, that it could be um, uh, dysplastic. So uh, that's 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 important. Most of these patients, um, they have this underlying predis predilection for posterior instability. So this study looked at uh, the MRI and looked at several uh, cuts of the MRI. What was most important was the inferior portion of the glenoid was significantly retroverted in these patients. So uh, not the top of it. So if you look at you know a um, axial section, you will kind of appreciate it better than just looking at a coronal section. So um, you know the the, the glenoid version was um, uh, significant in the, in the in the inferior half of the glenoid. So the conclusions being it was concave or flat in most of the levels uh, in our patients but level one that's the bottom bottom level all patients with post instability had convex glenoid uh, so that's you know so take home message from from this study is uh, if you have a patient with posterior instability or you don't know what's happening make sure you kind of assess the version in the bo bottom half of the glenoid either on MRI if you have an MRI already it is no harm getting a specific 3D CT scan if you're worried about it or you're planning some bony procedure along with it. So examination is pretty standard. We start with the you know, shoulder exam. Um, but when you look at the laxity of the shoulder, that's when we want to know what normal laxity is. Um, it's hard to define it, but uh, we know shoulder is a highly mobile joint. Um, and, and in some younger patients, uh, they are just uh, you know hyperlax everywhere. So we have to compare both sides and see what's really bothering the patient. Uh, posterior draw. These are the tests that I do, specific tests that I do in practice as well, and these are very important. Um, basically, you try to you know kind of try to sublux the shoulder. You stabilize the scapula as the as the picture on the left. But you can also do a modified posterior draw in smaller patients where you just push with the thumb and feel with the uh, four fingers. Uh, sulcus test, patient sitting, you pull on both the shoulders and look for the gapping. Um, um, always ask if it produces symptoms. If you see this as positive in the clinic, then you know it's uh, also a rotator interval that's involved. Uh, I had one patient, I did done a revision uh, surgery, I did a lateral on that patient. She did great after the surgery, um, but continued to have um, some kind of with pops and things like that. Doesn't dislocate anymore, but when I examined her, she had a positive sulcus on that side, and that's uh, you know, although we did the latter, we didn't specifically close the rotator interval, and that's that's kind of you know um, something which you need to know. Load and shift test in the patient in the sitting position, basically uh, stabilize the scapula and try to move the arm. Uh, this is not very important. And uh, posterior jerk test is, is an important um, um, exam that that is that I do in, in practice, and I find it very useful. Is basically across the arm, across the chest, and try to push it back. Any reproduction of symptoms in terms of pain or clicking is suggestive of um, a positive jerk test. Uh, the other day, at a 16-year-old, um, um, he 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 is in, into weightlifting and uh, he was lifting some 300 pounds by doing bench press. He felt a pop. Uh, first time seeing me four weeks after this happened. We did this test and the shoulder uh, shoulder kind of subluxed in, in the back. I could feel it sublux and then. After it subluxed, he could push it back on his own inside. So you can actually subluxate and dislocate the shoulder. So um, even before you got the MRI, we knew the diagnosis. It's a posterior labrum tear. He was lifting, um, you know, heavy weights and that kind of tore his labrum. 
So that said, examination and anesthesia in doubtful cases is the most important. You know, MRI, arthrogram, all those things don't help uh, sometimes when they have these um, you know, mild degree of instability. But what's most important in these patients is uh, examination and anesthesia. And which other orthopedic test do we know has a sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 93%? Right? It's, it's very, very uh, good. Um, so you know, the, the, the patient's relaxed under uh, an anesthesia. Uh, has no other ulterior motive and then you can actually see what's happening now uh, so that's about you know the, f the clinical exam so most important is that, that under anesthesia so sometimes if I forget um, make sure you remind me because sometimes you know you position the patient and then you know, the patient is already in that thing and then you know, we didn't examine the shoulder so it's important uh, but you know but x-rays are first um, as the first line of um, um, first line of management or diagnostic management we know that um, sometimes posterior dislocation can be missed, and uh, this is, or this is, you know, this cannot be overemphasized, especially um, um, in, in receiving when you see a lot of you know, trauma cases and things like that. Make sure you get a wide view, and then we move on to MRI to to diagnose posterior instability. There are four types. You don't need to know uh, each one, but uh, Kim out of um, South Korea, he. He described uh, the four different types on MRI and, uh, and correlated with arthroscopy in GVGs 2003. <coughs> and the Kim's lesion is um, is, is the one where um, you kind of um, you have an incomplete aversion type two, and there is a small crack in the labrum, so you don't really see a tear. But if you actually do an arthroscopy, you might find a crack, um, a small tear in the labrum, that is called as a Kim's lesion. Um, and then in type 3 you can see it's flat and it's completely like you know in line with that clenoid that's when you know it's not really uh, doing much and it's just um, and if you want to get fancy these are some um, studies that were done to kind of measure the actual height I don't kind of use it but you, you eyeball it and see if it's flattened when compared to the front you know there's something wrong with the posterior labrum we see an outpouching in the posterior side it is uh, much di diagnostic of posterior instability as opposed to in the anterior side you might see some kind of dye leakage from the subscapular recess and it may not be very conclusive depends on uh, <clears throat> depends on you know who did it um, but uh, if you see it in the posterior side then it has to be a uh, posterior instability ct scan we spoke about it so what about EMG or anything and is that make does that make any sense to be EMG on, on, on a patient with um, shoulder instability probably not but this is an interesting study we looked at um, the muscle activation and they found that there's definitely um, the muscle imbalance in these patients and that's why posterior or multi-direction instability we do send them for therapy um, uh, but it would the conclusion of this talk and the reason I included this in, in this talk is um, sorry the conclusion of the study and the reason I, why I included this is because um, of um, the fact that we could we could try and find someone in your uh, area who could do an EMG biofeedback you know so um, not many therapists will do that but for these especially for these multi-direction instability if you could insist or try to find someone who does EMG biofeedback that will be really helpful to these uh, to these patients so, if it's a traumatic posterior bank cut, uh, I guess it's an easy fix. You fix up the labrum and then that's, that's good. But if it's a non-traumatic, then first of all, you make sure it's not MDI, it's just posterior instability. And then secondly, you have to look for the glenoid version and then, you know, accordingly fix that. In my hands, I've seen that if it's a chronic posterior instability with some kind of glenoid retroversion, uh, some kind of cause for muscle imbalance, then I will straight away do an open posterior approach. I won't do arthroscopy. Um, so, for example, I had a 12-year-old with uh, with a prior history of a stroke, um, had muscle weakness on that side, and you know, still was functional. He could run and play and everything. And every time you know he, he tried to play basketball, his shoulder kind of used to dislocate in the back. So he had muscle weakness. We knew knew he had a muscle imbalance. There was a, this was a long-standing uh, thing. He had glenoid retroversion approximately 10 or 15 degrees, so and he was skeletally immature. So there's no way I was going to do a glenoid osteotomy on him and things like that. But um, we did an open, and he's now four years post-op, and he's doing he's doing great. He's back to his uh, normal activity. So and, you know sometimes uh, it's better just to open. 
Uh, the way we do it is uh, split the deltoid, put a gill retractor, split the intraspinatus so there are two main uh, uh, muscle kind of uh, planes, and then we um, look at look at the posterior aspect, um, um, and then turn what nerve is that? Yeah. So the suprasapular nerve, which uh, supplies the both supras uh, infraspinatus. Um, is is right right close to that clenoid, and then we need to make sure it's it's well protected. Um, typically, it's easy if you just follow your posterior portal track. So I'll start with the diagnostic arthroscopy, and then just go down. It's very easy to dissect that that route, and then um, then the application is like you do an open anterior. It's just basically uh, you make a T in the capsule, you can uh, base it on the humeral side, and then just imbricate it. Proximal humeral osteotomy has been described, and that is not very successful. Um, and you know, it does cause significant uh, external rotation deficit, so we don't do that anymore. And then it evolved all the way to arthroscopy, where uh, uh, where uh, they just first described in 1997, um, where what they did was um, basically they we didn't have anchors then, so they drilled holes to the coracoid and then, um, uh, sorry, uh, holes in the clavicle and then tied it over, over it and then they had great results, excellent results and that's uh, how we kind of moved towards uh, arthroscopy. So, um, so bottom line, if it's a posterior labral tear, posterior instability, you can, you know, put these uh, anchors in it <coughs> and if it is a, if it's a sociero glenoid version, you can either do a glenoid osteotomy. I didn't include that in my talk, maybe I should, um, about glenoid osteotomy. It's, um, it's a pretty invasive procedure and it's rarely indicated, but still. Um, and then, um, there's another paper that looked at um, posterior labor repair. Uh, it's one of the largest series out of Pittsburgh. Now, what's important here is in 43% of the patients, so half of the patients, almost half of the patients, they found no labral tear. So the question being, how do you know it's supposed to instability? So they included these patients in the in the paper. Um, the answer being it's clinical. So you know, an anesthesia you examine the patient, you, you find that is this subluxation posteriorly, positive jerk test. Even though the MR is normal, even though arthroscopically you see no labral tear, these patients still do have posterior instability. So that's that's the take home message um, from this paper as well as other studies. So what they found was. Most of the failures had just plication and no anchors. This is one of the reasons I like to put uh, anchors in all my um, instability cases because studies have shown that if you just do a capsule lab labor plication just with say a PDS or something and no anchor, uh, the failure rates are high and that's why you want to kind of make sure. So we'll switch gears a little bit, MDI. Um, again, a little difficult to diagnose in, in the clinic. Um, there are a lot of patients who come with shoulder clicking and popping. Which one is which ones are real? Which ones need surgery? That's the purpose of this talk because you'll see, uh, you know, in this clinic um, the, um, that you know there are a lot of adolescents who come with shoulder clicking and pain. Now, MDI is not a 360 degree tear, right? It's it's totally different from say an athlete who has been playing and ignoring shoulder pain and has multiple injuries and now has slap tear, posterior labral tear, anterior labral tear, that's a true 360 degree tear. Um, but MDI is not that, it's just generalized laxity and may have uh, absolutely no labral tear. What we need to know is that the collagen is not normal. We need to tell the family that no matter how uh, hard we try to kind of um, treat this with therapy or brace or even surgery, um, the, the, the new uh, tissue that will regenerate and, and will, um, will come back is not a normal tissue. It's going to be um, you know, deficient in some collagen and then uh, it might stretch out all over again. So that's something very important for us to know. An excellent paper that was uh, published and kind of um, <coughs> highlighted this fact uh, is that they took t tissue samples and did a whole lot of uh, kind of studies on it and suffice here is to say that, um, that the collagen in an uh, unstable capsule or MDI was completely uh, different from even a revision or a normal capsule. So that said, that said what they proposed was sometimes if you have uh, a chronic dislocator 
um, kind of it subluxes. It could be a chicken or egg phenomena, which means they might have a so-called little bit abnormal capsule, but they keep on dislocating and subluxating because of MDI, and then over time, uh, the cross links kind of change, and now they have a, a messed up situation. So. Um, so what are the uh, so how do you diagnose MDI besides from clinical examination? You try to you know do an arthro arthrogram and see if that is helpful. Now I think one of the residents last time or last uh, rotation raised a good point. Like it, how do you know how much dye do you inject in it? I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know the answer. So if you inject I don't know five ml versus ten ml, will that uh, give us a false diagnosis of you know ballooning of that? Uh, capsule and things like that or is it you know there's there might be some resistance which you know kind of tells you hey don't inject more uh, and then you can compare but you can see in all these pictures there's definitely a lot of laxity uh, in the posterior uh, or the anterior side and uh, the results of this study were <coughs> uh, were significant MDI has more capsular volume than normal um, and then the same with posterior they have more capsular volume so how do you treat MDI? We know based on clinical exam uh, story. Then we get an MRI. We see that it is all ballooned up. How? What do you do? What do you do from there? So first of all, of course, you send them for therapy, and that's that's um, uh, a no-brainer. They don't get better, especially very um, um, chronic cases that are going on for years and years. Then we talk about surgery. Um, this was in vogue a few years ago, um, actually, and then they um, these were great authors. They were very reputable surgeons. But the problem with these papers um, well, was that the follow-up. So follow-up is six months, twenty-seven months, twenty-four months, and you know, two years at the most. But the success results were very good, and everyone was so encouraged with, the, with these papers. And again, these authors are very, you know, reputable, great journals. Uh, everyone started doing them. I'm like, all right, like, this is this is it. All you need to do is take, you know, take your wand, go in there, and these MDI patients who have been bothered for so many years with subluxation. They're all better. They come back. They don't pop out anymore. Uh, you know what a great surgery. It just takes half an hour. I uh, just burn the whole like capsule, and everyone is happy. So that's what we thought. But unfortunately, um, again, Bradley uh, out of Pittsburgh uh, came uh, came out with this paper and just uh, you know um, spilled the beans on it. It's like he described the technique in detail so that there is no controversy how how he does it, which was how it was done at that time. And um, the conclusions were that in MDI, yes, they do great at two years, um, but after that, you know, it's a very high failure rate. So this kind of abruptly uh, dampened the enthusiasm uh, for thermal capsulography, and then no, we no longer do it. Some surgeons still do it. They say they still argue that while well, that was then, we have better uh, arthrocare uh, devices, wands, and things like that. And things are different. We do it a little differently, and all those things. But uh, but a lot of surgeons do agree it's just a sham operation. We need to do more than just burn the capsule, and that's that's it. So 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 how do you treat it surgically then if you don't do capsulography? Well, this is an excellent paper. I'm quoting this paper because this is the most comprehensive paper, uh, trying to trying to um, kind of um, specify uh, how to treat MDI. Uh, all they have just 34 patients. They kind of categorize their patients into. Uh, three or four different categories and uh, the procedures that they do uh, whether they attack just the posterior inferior side or the anterior inferior side and posterior inferior and whether they will close the rotator internal uh, capsule um, so if there is a crack in the labrum or loss of height you repair it with the anchors um, if you see you know, labrum tissue that's completely damaged then you know try to get do with the capsule we do do a capsule or shift both anterior and posterior so you put like three or four anchors there. Um, you see how they have two passes. That's sometimes what I do as well. So one through the labrum, one through the capsule. So you can cinch it all up and then reduce the volume. And uh, maybe you can read this, but basically um, what it, uh, what it um, uh, kind of encourages uh, us to do is to kind of uh, ensure where the instability is. So for example, if you look at the last row, if there's sulcus three, Positive jerk test as positive as well as anti translation, um, then you kind of kind of do the uh, you know uh, whole kitchen sink thing. You just do everything: uh, labroplasty, capsular shift, and then rotator internal closure. Um, 
as opposed to, for example, first row, when you're jerk test positive, sulcus is not very impressive, and absolutely no anterior translation, then you focus only on the posterior portion of it. So, so they had great results. Uh, it's just one of the papers that I uh, mentioned here, but um, it's just a it's just, uh, good paper is in JBGS. Uh, that's kind of a landmark where, um, for an MDI, now these are very difficult cases, 97% stable, so not bad. Only one failure, and this is all arthroscopy. And this is kind of the benchmark where that's why most of us treat MDI arthroscopically. We don't necessarily do the gold standard of open um, open application. That said, if they fail arthroscopy, then that's a fallback operation. So conclusions, posterior instability, clinical exam, uh, try therapy. Uh, look for posterior labral lesions. If you see a crack, if you see loss of contour, if you see um, a flattened labrum, um, then they will do better with an arthroscopy um, and, and plication. However, if they have, uh, if you do an MRI or a CT scan and you, you notice that uh, there's a significant glenoid version, then you might want to directly go to an open procedure and that you won't be wrong. Um, surgical results are good, uh, glenoid osteotomy, proximal humeral osteotomy, the results are not that great. So if possible, try to avoid those bony procedures for MDI. Um, clinical exam again is the cornerstone of diagnosis, but uh, MRI can show um, significant capsular volume. Uh, make sure even if it's an MDI, see where the predominant instability is, anterior, posterior versus um, sulcus test. Um, don't use thermal probe um, as the end all solution. Surgical results are good, but not 